Hello there, how are you doing today? It's Emma here, your bookish princess. Today's video is the last video of 2015. Can you guys believe it? I thought I would make the last video of the year a bookish vlog and share with you all my favorite books that I read in 2015. I actually had a really fun time getting ready to make this video because I went back through all my lists and was remembering all the fun things I've read this year. Also, I am a quotation hoarder. I love looking for the best lines in a book and then jotting them down as I read. I feel like it helps you slow down and enjoy the book more. So anyway, I tried to keep the list short, but in the end I had so many that I thought, you know what, I'll just make it a top 15 for 2015. Um, these books didn't come out in 2015, they're just books that I read this year. So, let's get started. So the first book I am going to start out with is actually the book that I started 2015 with. It's called Ancestors Brocades, the literary debut of Emily Dickinson. It's by Millicent Todd Bingham. It's nonfiction, so it tells the story of how Emily Dickinson's poems came to be published and debuted in the literary world. My brother Porthos actually gave this to me for Christmas last year in 2014. He went to his favorite used bookshop and he bought everyone in my family a book or two, just whatever he could find that he thought we'd enjoy. I feel like that was such a smart idea. I now want to do that for all of my gifts. Um, but I really loved getting to know more about Emily Dickinson. I had read her letters in the past and Emily Dickinson's letters are so beautiful. If you haven't read those, definitely go out and get them. Emily Dickinson actually only published maybe four poems in her lifetime that she sent into a magazine and they got accepted. Emily Dickinson had two siblings, her brother Austin and her sister Lavinia. When they were grown, they all lived together in the same town. Emily lived with Lavinia and Austin lived with his family and his wife Susan right nearby. When Emily Dickinson died, she left reams and reams of poetry behind and Lavinia was her champion and wanted to get them published. And it sounds like she first went to Susan, who had known Emily well and, and had read Emily's poems and also loved them. But for whatever reason, Susan didn't kind of move on helping Lavinia to get these published. So Lavinia went to some neighbors of the Dickinsons, who were close friends, the Todds, and Mabel Loomis Todd um, was one of the editors of Emily Dickinson's poems. She helped Lavinia. Lavinia gave her the manuscripts and Mabel went through them all meticulously. It sounds like Emily's handwriting was kind of hard to decipher sometimes. Picked out the best ones. They also had Colonel Higginson, I think was his name, who was who had been a friend of Emily's and had course they had corresponded and written to each other about her poetry. Um, this book is written by Mabel Loomis Todd's daughter, Millicent Todd Bingham. First volume of poetry came out, it was a great success, but then Susan came out and was very angry that the poems had been published without her and um, yeah, a lot of bad feelings between Mabel and Susan and Susan and Lavinia and then eventually Lavinia, who sounded like a kind of crazy lady, um, turned against Mabel and it just all sort of blew up. After I read this book I was really interested in the story but I felt like I didn't have a complete, quite a complete picture of it because um, this book obviously doesn't have much about Susan, it's more from the perspective of Mabel, and has all of her letters about the publication of the poems, her letters with the publisher and with the colonel, getting them ready to go. I wanted to, so I wanted to know more from like the other side, and I went online and was trying to research it, and to this day it seems like there's a Team Susan and a Team Mabel, and never the two shall meet. I wouldn't be surprised if they made a movie out of it someday, because it was just drama packed. The drama didn't really seem to explode until after Emily Dickinson's death and the publication of her poems in a way were kind of the button that set it off, but you understand Emily Dickinson a little more from knowing the kind of pressure cooker that she lived in. Just fascinating to read about the editing process and how they tried to make some of the poems a little bit more readable for the, the audience of the day. I really, really enjoyed this. And this brings me to my second favorite book of 2015, which is The Complete Poems of Emily Dickinson. It actually had a dust jacket with a um, silhouette of Emily Dickinson, but after reading Ancestors Brocades, I knew that the silhouette was kind of 
doubted, and anyway, I didn't think it was that pretty, so I just took off the dust jacket. So I have not read this cover to cover, but I just love kind of dipping into it and opening the page and seeing where it falls and then reading whatever I find. There are so many good poems for the seasons in here, for spring and summer and fall and winter, just all across the board. Um, and they're just so short, but so packed with meaning and beautiful expressions and just interesting ways of using words. I'll read this one. Dreams are the subtle dower that make us rich an hour, then fling us poor out of the purple door into the precinct raw possessed before. Emily Dickinson's poems can be a little hard to get started on. I know I felt that way. So if you're interested in them, I would definitely recommend getting a book with some background on her life, like Ancestors Brocades or a different biography, um, or even starting with her letters. Going to him, happy letter. Tell him, tell him the page I didn't write. Tell him I only said the syntax and left the verb and the pronoun out. Tell him how the fingers hurried, then how they waited, slow, slow, and then you wished you had eyes in your pages so you could see what moved them so. That's a longer poem. I won't read the whole thing, but I love that one. It's like the story behind writing a letter um, and how the, the heroine sort of hesitates to write. So this has definitely been one of my favorite discoveries of 2015. Um, I'm sure I will be reading these into 2016 and beyond as well. Speaking of complete collections, this one I've mentioned before, but I bought it in 2015 and have been hugely enjoying it. It's Jane Austen's Letters, the complete collection, the fourth edition, collected and edited by Deirdre Lefebvre. Uh, there are so many good lines that often get picked out and used in the movies or like thrown around as quotations on the internet. Um, but it's fun to read them in their original context and also read the lines that people haven't picked out and, you know, to pick your own new favorites. I have too many. I have 15 books to get there. I shouldn't be reading quotes. But I like reading quotes. <laughs> okay, here's just a short beginning of a letter. My dear Cassandra, do not be angry with me for beginning another letter to you. I read the Corsair, mended my petticoat, and have nothing else to do. Getting out is impossible. It is a nasty day for everybody. Edward's spirits will be wanting sunshine, and here is nothing but thickness and sleet. Like Emily Dickinson's poems, I haven't read this cover to cover, and also I like just dipping in and, um, you know, reading a letter at random uh, can be fun to just be surprised. This book I read over the summer, I read it in June, which is the perfect time to read Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf because it all takes place on a June day. Don't you love her sleeve? It's like so floaty. And her hat too, it's just all fabulous. And there are some really beautiful descriptions of flowers and the season and the springtime. Then again, there are pretty much beautiful descriptions of everything because Virginia Woolf's writing is just generally jaw-dropping and dizzying but in an amazing way. I also read Orlando this year, which is even more dizzying than Mrs. Dalloway, but also amazing. Virginia Woolf is one of those authors that you have to be slow in reading. You shouldn't just like sit down and plow through it in a day, because you're going to miss so much of the good stuff. It needs more time than that to kind of sink in. I read this over the course of the entire month in kind of like short batches. Yeah, Virginia Woolf, she just paints scenes in such an incredible way. Um, I have to pick a new Virginia Woolf to start reading for 2016. Alright, this book you might have seen in my December TBR. It's Gilead by Marilyn Robinson. I absolutely fell in love with it. It's such a gentle story, but it really pulls you in, and the writing is just, just gorgeous. Alright, we're just going to read a really quick quote, okay? <laughs> now, your mother never talks about herself, really, and she never admits to having felt any sort of grief in her life at all. That's her courage, her pride, and I know you will be respectful of it. And remember at the same time that a very, very great gentleness is called for, a great kindness. Because no one ever has that sort of courage who hasn't needed it. So this tells the story of an old pastor who is writing a letter to his young son um, so that his son will have it to read after he's passed away. There is a kind of Gilead trilogy. The other two books are Home and Lila. I really want to read them, especially Lila, because the, the mother that they were just referencing in that quote Seems like a really interesting character. And we don't get to hear her backstory in this book, but L Lila is her backstory. So I think that will be on my list for um, January. But I should save that for my January TBR. I don't know why I'm talking about that now. <laughs> so I quite like theology. Um, if you've watched any of my bookish vlogs, you will probably have gathered that. If you like theology, Gilead will be right up your street. Um, another theology book that I really loved is My Bright Abyss. It actually has a quote from Marilyn Robinson on the back. 
The thing that is exceptional about my bright abyss, aside from its intelligence and its language, is the quality of its theological reflection. It is very lucid and not at all simple, a book in the great tradition of truly serious thought. I found this book on a Lenten reading list. It was on one of those big book blogs. If you Google like 40 books for 40 days of Lent, the list will probably pop right up. Um, there were actually a lot of really great things on the list. Flannery O'Connor, uh, T.S. Eliot, I read a memoir called Townie that was really good that I found on that list. Um, and this, my Bright Abyss by Christian Wyman, I also found on that Lenten reading list. It's called Meditation of a Modern Believer. I feel like the name of this book is perfect because it is very bright. It is just sort of glowing. When I was in college, I loved the apophatic philosophers who like to define God in terms of opposites. So they like to say that God is light and God is dark. God is silence and God is noise. Um, and I felt like there was some of that in here. This. Um, understanding that God is beyond everything that we can think. He's beyond what we'll ever know. But there's still ways to get close to him and to approach that mystery. Christian Wyman is also a poet, um, and some of his poetry is in here, along with other people's poetry. Um, but I feel like his writing, his prose, is poetic. It's just beautifully, beautifully done, and these, some of these sentences just kind of shine out at you. Just, it's just a quick quote. I'll just, I'll just find a short one. To be innocent is to retain that space in your heart that once heard a still small voice saying not your name so much as your nature, and the wherewithal to say again and forever your wordless but lucid, your untriumphant but absolute yes. You must protect this space so that it can protect you. You must carry it with you through whatever milieu in which you find yourself growing too comfortable. The seductive assurance and instant contempt of secularism, the hive-like certainties of churches, the mental mazes of theology, the the professional veil of soul-making that a life in literature can become. Something in you must remain in you, voiceless even as you voice your deepest faith, doubt, fear, dreams. He puts into words things that are really difficult to put into words. Just an amazing book to read, um, whether you believe in God or not. Alright, my next favorite from this year is a D.E. Stevenson. It's called Listening Valley. Um, I've mentioned D.E. Stevenson in the past. I just love her books. They are British and delightful, but they have substance to them too. This one especially stood out to me. There were some really beautiful lines in it, and also the plot was just really interesting because it kind of takes a few different turns and really takes you through the heroine's life and through her growth. It is set during the World War. You see England and you see Scotland. Um, it was just hugely enjoyable, and there were so many quotes that stayed with me. There was one um, quote, and at one point one of the characters tells another to don't be afraid of life, but make friends with life. And I thought that was just such a cool way of putting it, to make friends with life. Life can be difficult, but it should be your friend. The next book is by an American author. I actually read it as an ebook, so I don't have it to hold up. It's called Diana. I'll put, a, I'll put a picture of it here. I'll find a picture, though, and I'll put one. It's called Diana by Susan Warner. You might be able to get it for free because it's a little bit of an older book. <laughs> surprise, surprise. One of my all-time favorite series of books is the Provincial Lady series, The Diary of a Provincial Lady by E.M. Delafield. I did read that this year, but I didn't put it on my favorites list because I tend to read it most years, and I feel like that would be cheating because it's really just one of my all-time favorite books. Delafield has just a million literary references sprinkled in, and Susan Warner is one of the authors that she mentions that she loves. I've also read Queechy by Susan Warner, which is very good as well. Um, it is long. Diana is a little bit of a marathon. Um, I feel like Susan Warner could have done with an editor just because sometimes she writes beautifully, but she just sometimes says the same thing in two different ways. You, as the reader, run out of <laughs> run out of Steve. Susan Warner is definitely charming, though, um, and writes uh, about the American past in a beautiful way. They're about fairly simple people, pastors and farmers. One may grow morbid over books, but I defy anybody in the company of these chickadees. So if you ever read too much, you should just go out and find the company of some chickadees. <laughs> Alright, another book that I don't have with me because I borrowed it from the library is also another long one, Daniel Deronda by George Eliot. I feel like I haven't read enough by George Eliot. I had read Middlemarch, but that was a while ago now. I really enjoyed Daniel Deronda. Just so many different characters. There was so there was such a wealth of different characters who were all fascinating. All right, we're gonna move into some children's books now. Anne of Green Gables. I read earlier this year. Beautiful, 
Puffin in Bloom series with a uh, cover by Anna Bond. I talked about this in my March favorites, I think. Gosh, that feels like a million years ago. I absolutely loved rediscovering Anne of Green Gables this year. I read a few of the sequels to Anne of Avonlea and Anne of the Island, and they're also amazing. Such a charming story, and Anne is just the spunkiest, most fun, most creative thinking and fun character. You just want to hang out with Anne all day. Alright, here's an Anne of Green Gables quote. It was reputed to be an intricate, headlong brook in its earlier course through those woods, with dark secrets of pool and cascade. But by the time it reached Lynn's Hollow, it was a quiet, well-conducted little stream, for not even a brook could run past Mrs. Rachel Lynn's door with, without due regard for decency and decorum. Here's another one. But just up the river, a little way from the house, there was a long, green little valley, and the loveliest echo lived there. I don't have my next favorite with me because my mom is actually reading it. It's Mary Poppins by P.L. Travers. I mentioned this in a bookish vlog earlier in the year. Of course I had to read it. I was Mary Poppins for Halloween, so it made me want to do some research, and I'm so glad I did because P.L. Travers as Mary Poppins is just so funny and snobby, and I just love her. Alright, this next one is also a children's book. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. This is a beautiful edition. It's the 125th anniversary edition. It has all sorts of cool illustrations in it. I've read Huck Finn before in high school, but I read it again this year because we visited Hannibal, Missouri, which is Mark Twain's hometown and where a lot of the events of Huck Finn and Tom Slayer are based. So I had to reread Huck Finn to, in preparation for that. I actually have a vlog from Hannibal that I really need to get working on. I'm tempted to try to find a Huckleberry Finn quote for you, but I'm going to resist. Let me just say that if you haven't had any Mark Twain in your life recently, you should probably fix that. I talked about this one in a video earlier this year, but it definitely was one of the exciting bookish highlights. Harper Lee, Go Set a Watchman, it came out in July. And I started reading it at the bookstore, and then I loved it so much that I had to buy it and bring it home. How beautiful is this cover? It just pops out at you. Those colors are perfect. I was reading all about the controversy when this came out and about Harper Lee, um, and I found this quote that she had once said she wanted to be the Jane Austen of Alabama. And I wonder if she only wanted to write one book, you know? Or if she just got intimidated by the success of To Kill a Mockingbird. Also, Ghost and a Watchman shows you a side of Atticus that many people didn't like seeing. So I wonder if she kind of knew that, that, you know, after she wrote To Kill a Mockingbird, she thought, well, no one's going to want to see this side of Atticus. So, beautiful writing, lots of funny stories, um, lots of funny stories from her childhood that are reminiscent of To Kill a Mockingbird. And an important subject, so I really enjoyed this one. Alright, we're almost done, I promise. I promise. Another book that I borrowed and so I don't have here with me, I'll put a picture of it though, was All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr. This blew me away. Um, I loved being able to kind of go back to France and Paris and St. Malo um, through the, the story setting. It was a World War II story. I love how it paralleled a German boy and a French girl um, and just, oh, the sunshine, you're killing me. You're killing me, son. How bad is it, guys? Is it really bad? Um, I did a whole video about All the Light We Cannot See, so I will definitely link to that below. I'll also put a link to my entire bookish vlog playlist. How many books have we gotten through? I think that's 14. I mean, I know I've mentioned more than 14, but essentially it's 14. One last book. I kind of had a hard time deciding which book to pick for this, and in the end, I went with Pygmalion by George Bernard Shaw. Um, I'd never read it before, I'd been meaning to read it, and I finally got around to it this year. It's a play, um, it's, the, My Fair Lady is based on Pygmalion, um, the, the movie is very close to the book, or the play, um, which was nice to see. There were lots of funny lines though, Mr. Higgins is just so delightfully unlikable. This light, guys, honestly, I'm a ghost, I'm a ghost. As the girl very properly says, Garn. I liked this one a lot that Mr. Higgins actually says himself. Here, here I am, a shy, diffident sort of man. I've never been able to feel really grown up and tremendous like other chaps. <laughs> right, well, those are my 15 top books, although now that I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking about all sorts of other fun books that I read in 2015 too. But this video has gone on long enough, so I'm going to cut it short and say I hope that you all had a marvelous Christmas and a wonderful holiday season. I would love, love, love to hear about your books, about what books you've been reading this year and what books you're looking forward to reading next year. So definitely hit me up in the comments and tell me what you've been up to. I hope you all have a wonderful New Year's Eve and a very, very happy New Year. 
Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of the fun videos coming up in 2016. As always, I hope you have a magical and a bookish and a wondrous day, and I will talk to you next time. Bye, guys.